lucky to have Hester to speak to us tonight about all the value of trees. So Hester, are you ready to go? I believe so. Okay. On the title page, you'll see two critters <clears throat> I would love to see in my backyard. You may not see them in your backyard. That doesn't mean they aren't around. The polythemus moth over to the side, beautiful one of the silkworm moths. <clears throat> John Snowden gave me one that he found in his shed one day when I was out at the, when he was getting grasses for me. This is one that is widespread throughout the country. And yet you don't see it very often because like most moths, it's going to be active at night and you won't see them very often, but they are here. The other little guy, the little green tree frog, they're mostly east. They're throughout the southeast, <clears throat> pretty widespread, but it's not usual that you'll find a lot of them in our area, but they are here. When I was teaching at the school on Cook's Lane, <clears throat> they had just made the green oaks cut through, and there were things moving into our playground <clears throat> that were not usually there. And one day we did find a little green tree frog, about two and a half inches long. They make a little chirping sound. And we never saw them after that. By the time they got the road paved and everything, I think they'd moved on. They need wet areas. <clears throat> and they might be in your backyard. But these are the ones we usually see in our backyard. So have a look. There's our little kitty cats. Unfortunately, the kitty cats have taken over so many areas with feral cats to the extent that they're really decimating the wildlife, particularly the birds, the lizards. It is found, they, there's several researchers has, have worked with feral cats and what they're doing in our backyard. And unfortunately, they're destroying a lot more than any of us would ever think. Let me go back. <laughs> the um, one researcher said there were 4.2 billion birds per year destroyed by cats. Now, I know a lot of people have cats and they think, oh, my cat doesn't eat birds. I feed it all the food it ever needs. And yet when they put a collar on those cats and they find that, yes, well-fed cats still like birds. That's the nature of them. But mostly what I see are the rascal squirrels, lots of bluebirds, uh, uh, blue jays, and uh, blackbirds. The mockingbird, of course. And those are what we often see in our backyards. As those very common critters. This is one that I would love to see in my backyard. Have you, have any of the audience, thumbs up if you've seen any of these in your backyard? Probably not. One summer, we were at my sister's house. She lived outside of Texarkana, and in her backyard were huge white oak trees. And it was a moonlit night, and we sat there at about, eight o'clock and we sat there till about 10 watching a couple of little flying squirrels uh, gliding from tree to tree to tree they would glide and as they glide they're not really flying so when they landed on the next tree they'd be a little lower elevation and then back and forth they would go until they'd reach the ground level and then they would chase each other back to the top of the tree and then start the aerial dynamics all over again, tree to tree till they hit the bottom. It looked like they were just playing. They weren't feeding. They were just simply playing in the trees. I would love to find some of those in my backyard. But if you go to the big thicket, they're there. They're throughout the east part of Texas. But you really have to be on your on your um, toes at night and really observing because even though they're very common in the big thicket, um, the people who work in the nature center there said they've actually never seen them. So you may not get to see them, but they are there. But we do have some flying critters in our, in our backyard. I don't know how many of you have seen the bats, but Ellen at, <clears throat> at the um, River Legacy has done quite a bit with bats and she's done a lot of talks about them. And she's gone out at night and really taken 
voice recordings of the sounds they make. She's checked to see what trees they're on because fortunately, bats do not have to have a building or a cave. Many of them just need a big tree. The ones that, that she found there in the park that they were using more for ro roost during the day were the pine trees and the pecan trees. But the little one that you see here is the evening bat. This little evening bat will also dwell in buildings in crevices and holes in the trees, but is not one that goes into the caves. Here are some of the others. Uh, the ones that you're gonna see now are all bats that are tree dwelling that you would, if you really watch at night, you may see them soaring over around the lamppost or over your house. Usually I can sit in my backyard and I can watch as they, they'll come out about dusk They'll fly around above the oak trees in my yard, and then they'll sail over my house, and I don't see them again. They're getting higher as they go over the house, but I don't know which ones they are. But here are some of the ones that you might find in your backyard. I doubt if you're going to get close enough to really look at their fur, but the little hoary bat, his fur has a white sheen to it because each hair is multicolored. It's kind of interesting. And the little Carolina bat, they, uh, look at their faces. They're fascinating. The little northern yellow, the eastern red bat, the Seminole bat, and the silver hat. Now, I've got two pictures of the silver-haired -hair bat because they're very different. Look at this one. It's a silver-haired also, but it has a white sheen, whether it's brown or black. And the southern yellow. And the western yellow, beautiful colored fur. But this is my nightlife that I will see. And they're not always just at night. I was at the Fort Worth Nature Center one afternoon and they were, the possums were out. They were in the wooded area and they were scrounging around, pushing the leaves aside, looking for grubs or whatever. But these are, these are one that I always see in my backyard. My dogs chase them, but usually the possum gets away. This is one that you shouldn't mind having in your backyard because they are actually, um, they're not going to carry rabies. They're not going to hurt you. They're, they'll maybe they will play possum. If you disturb them, they'll fall over and foam at the mouth. I've had them do it and act like they were dead. But as soon as you walk away, guess what? They're all alive again. And they do carry all those babies on their back. I've seen them do that too. But I do have possums in my backyard. Uh, raccoons don't come that far up from the waterways in my area, but they do. But there are some of the wildlife that we would normally see in our backyard that are in trouble. I want you to think about something that's happened over the last, I would say, 20 years or so. You see here a picture of my mother's 64 and a half Ford Mustang. When she got that Mustang, she was so proud of it. And we lived outside of Texarkana. It was about four miles into town. And by the time we would drive into town and back home again, guess what we had to do? We had to go and scrub off the windshield because there would be so many bug spatters that in order to keep the car clean, we had to clean them off right then. If I draw, if the times that I would drive with her to Dallas or to Houston, we sometimes stopped on the way to clean off the windshield. The last time I drove from Fort Worth to Texarkana, there was not one single bud spatter on my car. I drove to Houston and there was, I don't remember seeing any there either. <clears throat> so is this a problem? Well, where did the spatters go? If they're not there, is there something happening to our insect population? And yes, I think we all know there is something that's happened to the insect population. And that poor little possum and those bats and some of the others are possibly suffering from that. Let's let's walk. To, let's think about what could have caused the reduction in wildlife. And right now, I'm thinking mainly the insect population. Well, the reduced acreage available, and that's true for all wildlife that we just 
build more shopping centers, build more houses. And we've fragmented what we have. If you've got a quarter of an acre here and a mile away you have a, an acre, an animal can't use both those plots very well, most of them. We know there's pollution in the water, in the air, in the soil. But we've eliminated some on purpose. Think of the critters that we've eliminated because we, they were a bother to us. We don't want wolves in my backyard. Um, we don't, we don't want elk. We don't want the bears. I grew up in East Texas where there were mountain lions, there are pumas. They were there. We heard them. They're not there anymore because we have eliminated them. And chemical usages of all kinds. And not only that, we've got these lovely invasive plants and animals that some by accident, but some on purpose, we brought them in. But the one thing we can do as citizens is make better landscape choices ourselves. Instead of bringing in things that are foreign to our, our part of the country, use the native ones so that the wildlife will have a habitat and food to eat. Let's think about what a, a little, a, this is a very common bird. We all have chickadees in our yard. Well, Richard Brewer did a study back in 1961, and he found that for one clutch, this is a small amount, for one clutch of five to six little eggs, little tiny ones, 350 to 570 caterpillars. And it's mostly caterpillars that the little chickadees need. A lot of the songbirds. Caterpillars is their main food. Well, that's how many it's going to take. And six to 9,000 by the time those guys are ready to fledge. And then the adults will continue feeding them for another 21 days. So think of all the caterpillars that won't turn into moths and butterflies because those little chickadees need them for food. There are some particular species that we need to think about when we're thinking about conserving the insects, the birds, the rest. And some of them are called keystone species. A keystone, like you see in the archway, if that one block is lost, then the arch will collapse. Well, there are plants that serve that same thing. They provide a critical source of food and shelter. And the one biggest one in our area, and actually most of the United States, is guess what? An oak tree. The oak trees are considered the one of the main ones for the support of the food chain. This number of 468 is one that the research has shown that there are 468 butterfly and moth species in our zip code, and my zip code is 76012. And I, that was the, you go by zip code to find out. But the number has now gotten higher. I think it's over 500 now. A butterfly and moth species that do use the oak trees, all of the different oak trees, as host plants for their caterpillars. And here are some of the beauties. These are all ones that use the oak tree. They're certainly not all. You saw it was almost 500. But Promethea silk moth is another one of the big ones. The Climony moth, the spotted admiral. There are oak tree. The great leopard, a uh, beautiful moth, not, not as big as the big silk moths, but beautiful ones. And the one butterfly that it shows is a red spotted admiral, but there are a lot of other butterflies, as you noticed. So those are our oak trees. What about the plum? The plum suffer. It serves so many insects from the time the blossoms are there. If you go under a plum tree in the spring, when the blossoms are there, you can hear all the wildlife. You can hear the, the flies and the bees, moths, butterflies, and even beetles that are in that plum tree. And then later, of course, we feed a lot of the wildlife with the fruit on those plum trees. The native plums have wonderful fruit for a lot of the critters. But here are some of the butterflies and moths that the Mexican plum would use. The coral hair streak, 
Yeah, another one of the big silk moths, the Caletta, Caletta uh, the Glover's silk moth, and then the large lace border. So all of those are ones that prefer the Mexican plum. Willows, pecans. The willows, a 229 species of caterpillars will like that willows. And the pecans, 189. But you think about pecans, they support so much more than just the caterpillars. And think about the caterpillars. I know a lot of times you see the, the webs, the caterpillar webs in your trees. And you will see hundreds of little caterpillars inside that web. You know what? You can, you don't need to spray that pecan tree. I have a large pole, a fishing pole, and I just stick it in that, rip it open, and in, in a little while, you'll have all those caterpillars gone. The last time I did that, the blue jays, within 15 minutes, the blue jays had found that hole and were eating the caterpillars. So it was easy to get rid of those caterpillars, the tent caterpillars, that were going to mess up my pecan tree. But also the wasp and the bees, some of the wasps will grab those caterpillars to feed their brood. So the pecans and the willows are another big supporter. The, um, the willows, the morning cloak and the great leopard moth and the willow and the pecans might be the luna moth and the eastern swallowtail. I think a lot of you know the luna moth that has no feeding parts at all as an adult. It eats as a caterpillar to furnish it food for the entire lifespan. Never eats again as an adult. The morning cloak had an interesting thing with the morning cloak. I, when I lived in Colorado Springs, came home one winter day and on the side of the, the building that I was living in, it was white. And on the side was little black spots. I got up close and here it was. It was late February. It was a sunny day and it was solid with morning cloak butterflies all over the side of the garage. So that gives a clue as to how that butterfly spends the winter. It was a warm day. It came out. One of them, when we were opening the door and going in, one of them accidentally got in the house with us. We fed it sugar water for about a week and a half until we had another really warm day and we put him back outside again. So beautiful butterflies for the willows and the pecans. And here's another one. Hackberry, a sugarberry. It's a tough tree. Uh, sometimes a lot of particular landscape people will call it a trash tree. But there are 58 moths and butterflies and a lot of other insects that really love that hackberry. And also, think of the fruit that's produced by those hackberries. Birds in the winter and other critters enjoy that. But here are some of the ones that are on the hackberry. The question mark, again, the morning cloak likes it as well. And the hackberry emperor. I had something happen one day at the the Collins Street entrance to River Legacy. I had taken my lunch and I had my two dogs, Buddy and Molly, and I, I had gone to eat my lunch in the park. And the Border Collie, Molly, got real excited. She was right at some hackberries. I couldn't figure out what she was barking about, but when I went over to the clump of trees, I saw that there was clusters of hackberry emperors all over the bark of that tree. I don't know if they were just resting. I don't know if they were getting some liquid um, sap from the tree that they were sipping on, but there were probably 40 or 50 of those hackberry emperors on the side of the hackberry tree, which was a beautiful memory. I've not seen the morning cloaks there, but I have seen question marks as well on the hackberry. Okay, those are all canopy trees. But if we're looking at layers in our wooded areas, we need to look at the other areas as well. The understory, the shrub, the herbs, that would take two or three presentations by itself, and then the ground level. So let's look at some of the understory ones. Here are a couple ones that are understory and then they're not. The redbud, it's most beautiful, I think, when it's out in the open. It may be shorter than the other trees, but 
gorgeous. From the time those buds open in the spring, that red bud's going to be busy. There are 27 moths and butterflies that love it. But I don't know if you go out in the spring if you've ever tried it. But if you get a handful of those little open buds, take them in and either munch on them or toss them in your salad. They make a beautiful addition to a salad. And also, someone said they taste like, um, <laughs> like popcorn. I don't think so, but they are kind of crunchy and they are yummy. So a nice thing to try. I won't take very many because my tree is too pretty when they're in bloom. The other one that has a multi-purpose is, of course, the persimmon. The orange-colored uh, fruit on this is what I grew up with in East Texas. And I did not know uh, of the Texas persimmon until I saw it in books and everything. And then in Burleson, next to one of the pecan trees on our property there, there was a small tree and it on the ground underneath it was a mass of fallen fruit and it was black and it was our Texas persimmon. That mass of rotted fruit was just crawling alive with butterflies, wasps, bees, flies, all kinds of critters were eating that the remains of the fruit from the Texas persimmon. So the Texas persimmon, I don't know if the birds brought the seed in from the hill country, because I know there are a lot of them in the hill country, but you might be able to find some seed and get it started here. I took some seed, but I was not successful in getting the black colored uh, persimmon to live. But there are 48 in each of those uh, in the persimmon. And that is true of the Texas persimmon as well. And here are some. The uh, red bud, it could be the spice book swallowtail, one of the big ones. And the eye moth. I love the headlights on that guy. And on the persimmon, the beautiful American lady and the emperor moth. Now, one thing about the eye moth, their caterpillars are one of the only caterpillars I won't handle. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's green with that red-white stripe down the side. And the hairs on this will sting you. And they sting pretty bad. So watch it when you're at, out. Not everything that looks like a harmless little caterpillar is totally harmless because those will sting for quite a while. And the little ass, which is another one of the moths, that will really hurt. So be careful of those little guys. Now, I want them in my yard, but I don't want to handle them. The elderberry and the button bush or a couple of other ones that make wonderful understory or standalone ones. 24 moths and butterflies for either of them. The elderberry, of course, the berries are well loved by a lot of things. Um, you can even make some elderberry wine. How about that? I've never tried it, but they say it's quite good. And the button bush, I had something happen with the button bush. I was at Fort Worth Nature Center, and where we let the, put the canoes in on canoe fest days, it was probably late July, and there was quite a lot of the button bush growing right there by the bank. And I looked down, and most of it had lost all its leaves. But on closer examination, I found out that it, those button bushes were crawling alive with big, huge, fat, green caterpillars. I asked the people who were working at the Nature Center that day if any of them had seen what they turned into, and no one knew. I was going to collect some and take them home, but I couldn't find enough leaves to take home to feed them the rest of their maturing cycle. So I'm not sure what those button bushes were producing, but some more wildlife. Here's some of them that may have been. For the elderberry, it could have been the wood nymph or, the, or another one of the silk moth, the seropia. But for the button bush, it could have been the white lying sphinx or the white marked tussock. And the white lying sphinx, you know that those, <laughs> the worms that eat up your tomatoes are a sphinx. So you're destroying, <laughs> you're just, when you destroy the the cutworms and the, um, Tomato hornworms, you may be destroying a white line sphinx. 
because they all do turn into Sphinx. The next two plants I put in in honor of my, Molly Holler. I asked Anne if she would tell me who, what trees were Molly's favorites. And she mentioned the rusty black haw as being one of them. And I thought that's perfect. I couldn't find any research that said exactly which caterpillars might be eating these up. But if you've ever been around a rusty black haw when they're in blossom, you know that the pollinators are loving those blossoms. And not only that, you think about those droops in the fall. I have not eaten these, but they are actually very good to eat. I don't know if any of you have tried them, but um, the research said they taste like raisins when they're dried up. So I'd love to hear from you if you've tried them, but they're evidently very delicious if you wait till they're really ripe. So our rusty black haw, those feed a lot of different wildlife. The other one she selected was of course the possum haw. And we have some at the park that look so pretty. And these have multiple uses as well. They're not only a great place for birds to build their nest, for a place for safety, and just enjoying the leaves. Think about um, the all of the birds that go to the Possum Hall. It's really kind of interesting. There are 18 different birds that that seems to be their favorite food. But of course, they wait till late in the season because that's when they're the tastiest. And so we get to enjoy the berries for quite a while. Now, the leaf litter under that tree, the tree, when it loses its leaves, it hasn't lost the habitat for a lot of wildlife because they're there in the leaves. Let's think about those caterpillars when they get to their resting stage. Those cocoons could be, like the first little picture, hanging on a stem in the tree. They could have wrapped themselves in leaves and dropped to the ground and be in the middle of that pile of leaves. Or they could be scrooching down through those leaves and into the topsoil, as that last picture shows. So what happens, unfortunately, is we think those leaves don't belong there. So we rake them all up. And when you're raking them all up, think of how many little critters you may be raking up along with it. A lot of those caterpillars, a lot of the other bugs, wasps, all of them, utilize the soil and the leaves at the base of the trees. So when we can leave them, it best be done. Now, if they're out in your yard and they really are smothering your grass, maybe you want to run a lawnmower over it and chop them up. But then you may be chopping up cocoons and other things. But best, rake them, rake them next to the uh, flower bed. There'll be a protection during the winter. Okay, so we've talked about the leaves. We've talked about the tree itself. But you know what? Even the ground under the trees is a valuable habitat. Because that's where we haven't tramped it so much. We haven't packed the soil so hard that critters can't go in. The, a lot of the ground nesting bees, and a lot of native bees are ground nesting. In fact, most of them are. They will make holes in that. If it's bare soil, they can reach the soil more easily. So a little bare soil is not bad. And they can make those holes right through that soil. They may just make one central hole and then have little channels going off and have all of their little egg cases planted along the side. Even the little leaf cutter. The leaf cutter will do ground nesting, but he's also one that if you build those little bug hotels, he will often use the bug hotels. And some of the others use stems, hollow stems of, of, of your herbs and stuff that are under those trees, but also they will use the ground underneath. So bare soil, the leaves, all are perfect home for a lot of the native bees and wasps. But we're not through with what a tree does. Oh, this I have to tell you about. This uh, cicada killer, 
I had one in my yard for about five years. Well, a nest. I don't know that it was the same cicada killer, but he would fly about two feet above the of the soil in my yard and just buzzed all over. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's enormous. He's going to sting me. And then I found his hole. His hole was right next to the wall of my garage. And it was a pretty good size hole. And I know it was his because I saw him go in and come out a few times. And their main food is cicadas. So they're waiting for those cicadas to come out. They'll eat other things, but they love to, they love the cicadas. And even though we think of 17 year locusts or a cycle, but in Texas, there are enough different cycles that there are some cicadas every single year. Kind of interesting. I was at Texas Wesleyan at a conference and outside the science door, there were some flower beds there and there were dozens of these cicada killers flying around. And I thought, I've never seen them, but one at a time, what's going on? The professor there, the science professor was doing a study with one of his students classes about the cicada killer. I never heard the result of it, but they're benign. You're not, you would have to grab one of them to get stung. It could sting you. The males, the males don't sting you, but the female would sting you. But you would, as I said, you'd have to get it in your hands. They are very harmless otherwise. Hmm. Here's another thing you might find. Who's walked through the woods and been uh, <laughs> encased in webbing? Those are a valuable part of our wildlife, though, because think of all the critters that depend on the spiders, and the spiders do some benefit themselves. But a lot of our wasps, uh, the mud dabber wasp, one of his main foods is spiders. They'll grab a spider, paralyze it, stick it in their little clay house, and then lay an egg on it. The spider stays alive <laughs> and, lets, and lets the egg hatch and eat him up. Kind of gross, but the spiders serve an interesting part of the wildlife that we find in our in our forest. And then once that tree's dead, it's not through. I had a peach tree that died in my backyard and I didn't cut it down right away because it was so handy to hang bird feeders on. But one day I watched a little downy woodpecker going up and down and up and down the stems. I happened to go out and look and the, <laughs> the entire bark of that dead tree were covered with ants going up and down, up and down. And the bird was sitting there and biting, having lunch. So even in death, the tree is furnishing another habitat. I want you to look at that first one. Look at all the holes in that. Think of all the birds and the other things that could have found a home in that. If you have a standing dead tree and it's in a place where it would cause no harm and it's not in your front yard so the neighbors would fuss, maybe just leave it. And if you need to, lay it down. And then let some vines grow over it. And then you still got the benefit of habitat for beetles and bugs and all kinds of critters. And maybe even, if it's standing, a good place for those raccoons that you may have in your yard. And I'm kind of glad I don't. My dogs would not like it. If you look at this one below, you can see little tiny bow holes. A lot of times when a woodpecker is pecking on a tree, he's trying to hear the little larva inside that tree so he can peck and get them. So even in death, the habitat is there. If we take it all to the landfill or we burn it all, we're destroying another part of the circle of life. And then, of course, if it's rotting, that adds nutrients back in the soil. My whole, the whole thing is trees have a reason and not only are they beautiful and lovely to be under, but they are a great addition to all of the things that we have in our yards. Now, if you want to do some research, this is my best advice. The um, National Wildlife Federation, if you go to nationalwildlifefederation.org, Native Plant Finder, you put in your postal code, like I put in 76012, 
and you'll find out which woody and herbaceous genera native to your area are best at serving as host plants for caterpillars. And you'll you'll discover native plants ranked by the number of butterfly and moth species and, that use them as host plants. And I used part of that for the research. And the other to go to is Audubon. And you go to Audubon and it's plants for birds. Select take action from that website. And again, use your postal code and you'll find the plants for birds. They don't list the number of butterflies, but they will list the ones like the possum haw that have the berries and the, the rusty black haw. They will list ones like the pecan, the ones that feed a lot of birds. And also they'll find out the ones that are best for nesting or other things. Um, there's three books that I've I've enjoyed thoroughly. Some of you have this book, Bringing, Bringing Nature Home. We were at a native plant meeting in Austin, I think when I purchased this several years ago. And I read it and I thought, oh my goodness, this is the kind of book I wish I had the knowledge to write myself. I don't and never would have, but I love that book, Bringing Nature Home. And then with another author, Doug wrote Nature's Best Hope, which is, again, kind of builds off of for me, nature home, but it's excellent. And I mentioned earlier that oaks were one of the keystone trees. Well, there, there is the book out that's the nature of oaks. And he takes, a Doug takes the tree, the oak tree through the year and talks about what's happening with the oak at the different times of the year. So I have those books. If you want to borrow them, you're welcome to them. But otherwise, go on those websites and do a little research. And I think it'll make you appreciate your backyard even more than you already have. Are there questions? Uh, Hester, there are a few in the chat. Um, you see uh, Nadia, well, when she comments, like she's noticed that the um, buck moth caterpillars have exploded in number over the last four years. Uh, never used to see, but a few each year, if any, but now they're everywhere around here. She lives in Glen Rose. Host on, they host on oaks. Do you have an idea what would cause that, that explosion? No, and I didn't hear you at the beginning what you said they were exploding with. What is it on them? The buck moth caterpillar. Oh, well, yeah, there are, there are so many of the moths that they kind of hit a cycle. And they'll come on the gangbusters and then they won't be. Some of it is we've destroyed whatever was taking care of them. I do not know. I would love to know. That's something I'll do some work on. I really okay. do. Okay. Um, she also commented on, I've seen, heard the the news about it too, that the 17 year cicada and the 13 year cicada are going to be emerging at, at the same, same time, time. This yes spring. i did the I last did. time that happened was 1908 <laughs> so expect for that Nadia. it'll be an interesting year when they all start emerging okay. but there are there are some that are two year cycles they're not big explosions like those 13 and 17 year ones but there are some that are two year which is interesting i i did not know that until recently and i did did a bit of work on trying to find out like you said when the when the cycles were going to be huge so we'll have to watch for those those cicada killer wasps i don't know if they'll cycle along with it or if they'll only eat enough to the next year have too many that's often what happens what else um there aren't any more questions but if anybody has one you could just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask ask it yourself I was just going to say they're not going to converge here. They're only going to, their habitat is in different places. Uh, only in certain places do they overlap. Yeah. Kind and of like back east or something? Yeah. Okay. Okay, there is a question. What is your preferred oak to plant here in Arlington? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> uh, it depends on where you are. You know, if you are in a small area you need to look at the smaller ones uh, there are several that are not big like the white oaks and the post oaks and the red oaks that are suitable for small yards and i think if you go to a nursery and you tell them that's what you're looking for 
for goodness sakes, don't get a big one and not that doesn't fit your property. So many people do, or they put it under power lines and then the power line companies, they chop it and it looks horrible. And some, you know, a lot of them were planted by the birds and we don't have a choice wherever the squirrels and birds decide to plant a tree. But yeah, there are several of the small oaks that would do well. But I, I won't. I won't attempt to name them because I'm not sure which ones would ever be in stock. I mean, like most things, other plants, you know, you got to also consider the habitat, what you want to do, what, where you're going to plant them. Yep, exactly. Uh, any, yeah. any more questions? I would just say, uh, I don't know how many of you have experimented with this AI. Oh, uh, yeah. What I mean... Talk about delivering nature. You want to know what butterfly host on the button bush? Yeah, it it, it has a, a nice it list of those. Oh, the you website that, that one I phrase. gave you. You say that one phrase and it tells you it's the tiger swallowtail. Uh -huh. Well, I but there are there are. That's there are, the primary. Yeah, there's okay. there are quite a few of them that do the button bush. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, about the cicadas, um, I was in Washington, D.C., and it was, goodness, May, I, I believe late May. Anyway, a lot of the trees there, the ends of the twigs were brown, that about three inches of the end of every every branch of the trees was brown. And I got to talking to some of the people who were there and they said, oh, the cicadas, <laughs> they lay the, they make a hole a few inches from the tip of the tree and lay their eggs. And then that tip falls to the ground and the caterpillars then go into the soil and become and live there for however many years the cycle is. And it's it's a cosmetic thing more than anything else. But it really looked strange because if you know all of the cherry trees that are around at Washington, D.C. that have been planted as a memorial, not a memorial, but they're, they're there. I think well, uh, Japan, I think, was responsible for having those planted there. You may know the story. I don't. But anyway, it was interesting to see how the cicadas had, had decorated all the cherry trees with the stems brown. But anyway, Mister, I have some uh, white crepe myrtles that uh, in my yard, and I was surprised this morning. I looked out, and uh, there were chickadees, and uh, the cardinals were pecking on the buds. Yes, and, and I you don't know if that's common for crepe myrtles, or is it just <laughs> a variety? Uh, they, that... It's it's kind of funny. My my mother had a quince outside her window. And she had bird feeders right next to it. And we watched the birds in the spring. They came and they ate the buds. They decimated her quince by eating all the little buds off. So they we got no blossoms that year. I don't know if the birds were just hungry. And that was a you know good food source. But I noticed that the cardinal was in my quince doing the same thing. So maybe the crepe myrtle was providing some food for those birds. Yeah, I was surprised because crepe myrtles are usually considered to be not too. too no, they're not, they're not. If you look at the list, it doesn't have anything listed for them as a food source. But they do make good nesting material sometimes. Well, you but, guys, thanks for your patience. Well, you had good information, Hester. So thank you for that. One of the things that you want to attract some birds to your yard sometime if you have a cat, just save the cat buzz all all the time when you brush your cat. And then when the birds yeah. are moving, just throw that in your yard and you'll find that especially if they're if it's they're building nests, the chickadees and the tip mice and everything else will go after that and, and grab it and take it away. Right. And uh my dog's fur, that makes a good I sometimes put it out big bunches of it and the, they like it you do have to be careful though if you have yarn sometimes 
hummingbirds will put something like that in their nest and it'll actually catch the feet of the babies. Mm. So make sure that you don't leave the wrong kind of things out for them. Kind of an interesting thing. I never thought about that, but but I do leave I do leave uh, stuff out for the birds to make nests with. Okay. Hey, that is all the questions that um, people posted. 